David, I wanted to ask you, in your experience, how significant is the gap between generations in terms of decision making and risk appetite? And then how do you bridge that gap? Oh, I think in a lot of cases, Rob, it's huge. And it comes back to some of the things we were talking about earlier. If you don't have a structure in place within your family to talk about some of those issues on a regular, informal or formal basis, you inevitably are setting up a higher risk profile that there's going to be a disconnect between the generations. And on the other hand, if you have a structure in place where you have regular family discussions and you're giving every family member a voice and they understand who they are, what they stand for and where you're going as a family. So let's just go, who are you? What do you stand for? And where you're going as a family, you've got a much higher chance of connectivity with all of your family members. So the gap that you call between the generations is not there because you brought everyone along on the same page, on the same path. And tragically, what leads to this fractured family list is when that doesn't happen. When the patriarch or the matriarch decide it's our money, it's not the family's money. I've done it, I've created it, it's my money, I'm gonna make that call. That's fine, but that's the dictator, that's the general. That's not going to be the best way to bring their family, the next generation, onto the same path as what they are. Now, presumably when clients approach you and, and some of these wealthy families approach you, they are seeking help. But are there any examples of, of families or, or clients that you haven't been able to assist with just because they're not open to the suggestions? One of the things I learned, Rob, when I, I did various courses was sometimes people are impossible and it wouldn't matter how good you are what advice you gave them, what choices you gave them, they're not prepared to help themselves. And so there's been a couple of cases I can think of where the patriarch uh, in particular has not wanted to be vulnerable. He wasn't prepared to sit with his kids in a safe environment and hear comments from the children about how he was not as a businessman, but as a father. And he couldn't cope with that. It all got too hard. Okay, so we tried and he couldn't cope with it. And I said, but your aim is to have a happy, united family. Your aim is to bring your kids closer together with you. And so part of the hard yards you've got to do, you have to hear their reaction because you're an absentee father. You weren't there on a Saturday morning going to the netball or the basketball or the football. You're in the business. And that was all understandable in the early days. But the kids don't understand it today because you've got all the money in the world, you're living in the middle of Turak, you've got three cars, you've got a happy wife, all the money in the world, but the kids need to get it off their chest. And so if you don't have that safe environment, the, you don't provide the opportunity for the kids to tell their parents as it is, that leads to a breakdown. And so I've had a couple of cases of that where the patriarch, too hot in the kitchen, not prepared to be vulnerable, left it. Nothing else I could do. And what about when clients uh, approach you? How, what is it that brings them to you over others, do you think? Is it the, the family name, the family experience? Oh, well, I, well, you know, can, I, I know what brings them to us, mm. whether it's us or any other family advisor. There's usually a catalyst for that. Often it's they've listened to a mate that's just uh, told him a story about how his kids you know, aren't talking to him anymore or they've stormed out. Uh, or there's a divorce in the family, or there's usually a catalyst from the pick up a phone or send an email, I've heard of the work you do. But it's not yet very well publicised. I mean, I know every time there's an article about breakup in family businesses or we talk about what we're doing at Point Made or others, the phone rings. And not often the catalyst is just reading that newspaper, reading that article. Or unfortunately, looking at what's happening in some of our very well-known families, they're in court with each other, and people think, oh my God, how do I sit in this? Where do I sit? Where do I sit with my family? Why they pick Point made than anybody else would, you'd have to ask them. I think it's been opportune and very good that I've been there and done it. So the Smorgan experience, I think, Smorgan is a well-known name, certainly in Victoria. The fact that we were a very successful family that then imploded, I think people recognise, well, David must have learned something through that process and maybe he can help us. And just pivoting slightly to, to two topics. One, when you were at Consolidated Industries, uh, what were you doing there? What was your role over the, the journey that you were there? I think you were there for about 50 years, but... Hey, come on, I was only there for 25 years. 25 years. Uh, I, was there for, I was there from 1972 to 1996. And um, uh, before that, I was a lawyer 
and I was only a lawyer for nine months, so I hated that. And then um, Victor Smorgan, our chairman, collared me at my brother Rodney's engagement party and said, I heard you're not enjoying the law, why don't you come out to the factory in Somerville Road, West Footscray, and get a real job? Well, that real job was starting down in the gut house. Uh, not exactly the place to start your career, but we learnt the hard way, and I now use my experiences to encourage others to get their kids down and dirty. And so from the gut house, we went through the offal room, and then you went to the boning room, and then the slaughterhouse, and then after about five years or so, you make it into an administration job or selling job, in that case, in, in the meatworks. And so you do the hard yards first. There's no substitute for that. You just can't come in because you've got the right surname and think you're going to be a, a big-time executive. It doesn't work. And the Western Bulldogs, you were the president there for 15 years. Why did you take that role on and what did you learn? No one else wanted to take it on. <laughs> um, and again, look, I've followed the Bulldogs since I was a kid, since 1954. And um, I mean, I maybe aspired to play league football in my dreams, but I never aspired to become a president. And I wasn't supposed to be the president because there were four guys where we put our hand up or our hands were put up for us to join a subcommittee looking at, is there a future for the Footscray Football Club? And I was one of those, there's no future. We've got no money, no players, no coach and no hope. That was the attitude I went in with. And it's amazing when you start focusing and you lock yourselves in a room as we did from August in 1996 to probably December, the end of that year, uh, full time just looking at options and choices. And the crystallizing moment was when we looked at the map of Victoria and we looked at the western part of Victoria, forget about Geelong, because they're farmers down there. The western part, hang on, that's Footscray, that's the Bulldogs territory. But Footscray was just a small little suburb there that had moved from very white Anglo-Saxon and now into Vietnamese community. So we couldn't rely really on Footscray to give the support, but hang on, what about in Werribee and Hoppers Crossing and, and, and all that out through, um, uh, that whole Western region, it's open territory. And we had Essendon on one side and then North Melbourne down there. We said, hang on, this is it. We've got to be the Western, the Western Club, the Western Bulldogs, um, which was great. And then I was threatened. <laughs> I was going to be sued, you know, destroying a hundred years of tradition and naming rights. And we got over that. And probably that strategy that we had was probably, we were just 10 years too, too slow. I mean, it took probably 20 years for that to be successful as compared to the 10 years we thought. But today, the kids in the kindergarten and grades one and two and three in Sunbury and Keelor and all that area, they don't know Collingwood, they don't know Essendon, they know the Western Bulldogs. Mm. And helped by, of course, our premiership win in 2016. So um, looking back, it was a brilliant move. And what about the game today? Do you still have a, a love for it and a passion yeah, for absolutely. it? absolutely. Still go regularly? I well, when I can, uh, apart from COVID. But now I go with my children. I'm blessed to have nine grandchildren. We all go together and um, it's one of the wonderful things. I, I, I enjoy today sitting in the outer uh, with them, so to speak, as compared to being in the inner sanctum because it was actually 16 years, I think, Rob, I was president and a lot of lunches, a lot of networking, uh, a lot of proud moments, a lot of disappointing moments. It was an incredible experience and a privilege to, to, to do that. And um, I look back at I think I learned a lot. Um, in a business sense, in a personal sense. And um, I did my very best. I went in there with the attitude, I, I want to go in and do my very best. I want to look myself in the mirror the day that I finish. And so I gave it my very best and what we achieved, we achieved. And what we didn't achieve, well, I can't do anything about it anymore. I gave it 100%.